Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, live stream that we're starting now for the month of May. Uh, very excited about uh, the curation of these upcoming broadcasts. Uh, I wanted to be begin with a program that's very special to me with uh, small miniature characterized pieces, many of which I've uh, grown up with, uh, started in my uh, primary school years, lived through teenage uh, breakups and uh, uh, through adulthood, uh, most recently in Carnegie Hall last year, uh, May 2019, when I played them in the second half. And it was a very special, very moving experience. I will simply never forget uh, entering that building. It was my debut. And the, the, the incredible presence um, of all the great legends of the piano that have come across that stage, that building, the incredible intense energy of that building. And already the thick walls had such an insulation to the frenzy of of the outside world. And I was shocked when I first came to the piano and the uh, piano was, was, was full of blood from, from the concert uh, that took place the night before. And I went up to the stage manager and, and said, uh, yeah, excuse me, there's, there's blood on these keys. And he simply took out a little cloth and he says, oh, oh, I thought I got rid of all that. And so he, he started you know brushing it off like, you know, nothing ever happened, and there we go. <laughs> We're ready to rehearse. So these uh, 24 preludes are some of the most characterized, some of the most uh, dynamic works of the piano literature. We're taken on a sort of emotional roller coaster from the depths of, of sanity, the depths of, of euphoria, to the very uh, lowest points of, of, of despair and melancholy. And Chopin wrote them in Valdemosa, where he often escaped to. This is a, a, a beautiful um, island in Spain. And, and he often escaped and lived in a little monastery there in Valdemosa uh, to deal with his uh, tuberculosis, with his poor lung condition, which had trailed, uh, especially the last years of his life. And uh, he would escape the damp weather from Paris and come to this more balmy uh, Mediterranean landscape. And with him, he took the well-tempered clavier of Johann Sebastian Bach. And Johann Sebastian Bach was the first major composer to write a cycle of miniature works, all in different keys, each one in a different key. So beginning with C major, C minor, C sharp major, C sharp minor, and would go up the scale un until he reached all 12 keys uh, of major and minor. Frederick Chopin was so inspired by this, as was every composer who came after Johann Sebastian Bach, and did the same idea, but instead of writing a prelude and a fugue, a fugue being the most intricate form of polyf polyphony, polyf polyphony uh, of polyphonic writing, instead he characterized only the preludes, and instead of going in a sequential order up the chromatic scale, he did the circle of fifths. So he went C major to G major, and if a tuner ever comes to your home to tune your piano, he always starts with the fifth because it's the easiest for the ear to grasp. So uh, he did C major, and then the relative minor of A minor, and then G major and its relative minor, and he simply went, keep, kept going up in circles, in, 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 the, in the circle of fifth, which eventually comes back to C major. So because of that, because of this, we, we literally have these, these giant leaps of emotional um, affect, affect. And we begin, for example, in C major, which is a key of great rejoice and reunion. And then immediately after, these, these first initial preludes are only 30 seconds, 45 seconds long. And immediately we hear something of a funeral procession in number two. 
And then again, number three, G major, witty, uh, with this delightful uh, pattern in, in, in the left hand. And, and then E minor, once again, despair, sorrow, longing, regret. And uh, we shift back and forth like this, possibly reaching the height of emotional difference in 15 and 16. More on that later. Uh, Wikipedia, not a good, very good source for any academic research uh, or great musicology, but nevertheless, if you, if you look up the preludes, Opus 28, on Wikipedia, You'll notice a wonderful juxtaposition of the impressions of some of two of the greatest pianists of, 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 of hailing out of the late 19th century tradition of piano playing. Uh, their impressions are juxtapo juxtaposed for each prelude. So we have Hans von Bülow, a 19th century uh, German conductor pianist, and then Alfred Cortot, uh, French pianist and their ideas their impressions of each prelude are radically different in fact my impression is always that Hans von Bülow almost nails it he uh, finds uh, 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 in a couple of words, the kind of essence of the music. Uh, for example, he number one in C major is a réunion. Um, this is Hans von Bülow uh, saying in French what he thinks about the piece, a, a reunion. And uh, going on to number uh, 10 in C sharp minor, you hear this cascade of, of, of treacherous, difficult, um, awkward, pianissimo, very soft uh, set of configurations that, that go down the keys in C sharp minor. And he says this sounds like a night moth, a little bit murky. Uh, whereas Alfred Cortot calls it rockets descending down to earth. Uh, complete contrast. Now, mind you, Alfred Cortot uh, was a bit of a drug addict, especially towards the end of his life. Uh, he took the painkiller morphine. So uh, he, sometimes his ideas are, are, they may seem a little bit outlandish. However, extremely interesting. And if you listen to his recording, he takes these preludes always to the depths of what is one thinks is possible. To, to not the depths, but the, perhaps the edge, perhaps the edge of a cliff where you think, no way, he, he, that's not possible. And that's what makes it so interesting. And uh, we, we hear also in, in number six, in the key of B minor, another interesting example of, of some of the despair, some of the, the incredible sadness that, that Frederick Chopin experienced in his life. And what's interesting about number six is that in the right hand, you'll hear a repeated B all throughout the prelude, which is roughly a minute long. And apparently, in, we know in a letter that was written um, from Georges Sand, who accompanied uh, Frederick Chopin uh, in, during his journeys in Spain, we, uh, Chopin had apparently heard a raindrop hitting the roof in a rhythmic way. And it's a question to this day whether that, that rhythmic raindrop had been incorporated into the raindrops we hear of number six and later in the left hand of number 15, the so-called little raindrop prelude. Uh, in any case, the B minor, this number six, has that melancholy, a very, uh, a, a line, the kind of design for the cello that, that, that weeps, similar to number four. We hear this sighing and weeping in, in the line, a kind of heavy melody. So um, with this in mind, uh, I, I would love to now get your impressions uh, in, in the comments when, when we hear each, each prelude. Uh, close your eyes and what is it that you envision when you hear these works? Now from a 21st century period of isolation, where we can just let our imagination soar and enjoy this beautiful music again.
So we, we've uh, completed half of the preludes. Uh, that was number 12, and we're midway, the so-called uh, eye of the storm. And I just want to take a little tea break, something I would ordinarily not be allowed to do in a concert setting. But um, let's just recalibrate our, our thoughts at the moment um, and ponder about uh, what's, what's about to come. Uh, usually when I make it this far, I, 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 I feel like I, I, I can make it th through the end. So number 13 goes back to the roots of, of Chopin's pianistic concepts, uh, compositional style, where we have the three elements of, of um, Polish uh, pride, national uh, folk traditions, the beautiful Italian cantabile uh, aria, aria style of writing, very much influenced by, by Donizetti, the early 19th century operatic composers, and um, also a, a French kind of elegance and charm that naturally he had picked up living in, in Paris throughout his life. So we now enter number 13 into the key of F sharp major, which is a, has always been um, up to the mid 19th century and, and, and beyond a, a, a kind of warm key. Think, think of uh, also Bach's well-tempered clavier. The F sharp major are, are some of the most harmonious. And uh, we, in, in this one as well, we, we, we have uh, a flowing left hand pattern and a series of, of, of notes, long notes, in, in the right hand that, that tell a story. Courteau kind of called this one on, foros, on foreign soil, under a night of stars, thinking of my beloved from afar. It's very poetic and there's a dark middle section. And as I had mentioned before, the greatest disparity of, of emotional heights occurs in number 15 and 16. 15 perhaps being one of the most popular of intermediate solo piano literature, the little raindrop prelude. And right after that, we're, we descend right into the abyss in the words of, of, of Courteau and um, experience one of the most treacherously difficult of Chopin's works, if not perhaps the most difficult. And uh, the num number 17, number 18, again, uh, go uh, change between the, 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 the cantabile, the singing, and right down back into the abyss, uh, which Hans von Bülow called number 18 adequately, uh, the one in F minor, simply one word, suicide. And we end this cycle, number 24, with uh, an unsettling configuration with a wide leap in the left hand and the stern kind of melody uh, that breaks the D minor chord. Dee da dum. And uh, it's a very stormy scene that uh, at, at the very end uh, has, has a brilliant arpeggio that goes from the very heights of the piano right down to the very end where we hear three Ds ending the incredible cycle of, of all 24. Uh, often in, 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 in actually number 17, you'll hear also uh, a kind of bass note that repeats and that, again, f based on the letters, may have been the, the bell of, of a cathedral, a nearby cathedral, that Chopin had heard working in, in, in the midnight hours. And we, we have 11 of them. So enjoy the, the rest of the cycle.
There we have the 24 preludes of Chopin. I feel just as exhausted and sweaty as if it were a real concert. It, it was a real concert, but there, there is no audience here, obviously. And uh, I, I, however, I feel your presence uh, with every note and, and, and th that energy comes through. And, and I, I thank you for joining me on this, this wonderful journey. And I look forward to everything that will still happen, uh, the magic that will come out of this instrument this, uh, this month. Uh, I'm very deeply appreciative of all the wonderful sponsors who have helped keep this project going. Uh, last month there were so many private donors who came in with donations of all amounts. Every amount, no matter how small, is, is uh, very helpful to, to keep this project running. And I uh, am now investing everything that came in into new equipment, a new lighting solution so that this can feel more like a concert hall in future sessions, a kit, a soft box, uh, and um, you know, like the photographers have umbrellas and, and professional lights. So I'm investing in a new kit. Um, uh, also in, in uh, a professional streaming solution and um, um, equipment uh, such as this lapel mic I'm using to, to speak to you with. Uh, 
to keep the, the quality standards very high. And also piano maintenance. A piano like this, longest piano in the world, requires uh, little, you know, little steps along the way, voicing the aliquots, voicing the hammers, getting the tuning just right, um, every week before every session. So there, um, we, we have a piano tuner that, that comes in and um, you know, works, on the, works on the piano, uh, um, approved by Fazioli, uh, a, a licensed technician. So um, there's uh, all these aspects and I'm also very deeply appreciative to the new media sponsors who have come in. Um, uh, of course, my, my, my loyal supporters, the new classical FM in Toronto, have been absolutely wonderful in, in getting the message out to their lists and uh, Fazioli Pianoforte has come in as, as a sponsor as well and uh, the BBC Music Magazine has published it on their blog uh, as well as NPR uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very deeply appreciative to all of you for, for tuning in today um, and, and enjoying this, this journey together with me. So I've now put together a GoFundMe campaign. It's my first ever crowdsourcing project. And uh, everything I just talked about um, is what I would like to, how I would like to upgrade this project for, for this month and beyond and see where this project goes. It's a whole new experience. It's very bizarre talking to a, to a camera, uh, but I can feel your presence here with me right now. And, and that's, I think, essential. And once live concerts hit again, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna be pretty darn ready for with a lot of new repertoire. So uh, thank you, thank you again. And, and now we'll start our, um, our Q and A and I'll just grab my, Hey, so thank you so much. I, I, uh, there is a, a slight delay. Uh, I hope you're on the YouTube link page because that's where I'm at now, the YouTube link page. And uh, please send any of your comments. I, I, I see wonderful little compliments have come in. Thank you so much. Um, Don Beaulieu, this was absolutely fantastic. Appreciate that very much. Wonderful, bravo. Uh, Jeannie Sire, wonderful concert, loved it. Comments too, well thank you. Uh, you're welcome to submit um, uh, in that chat box on YouTube, on the YouTube link, any comments you might have. There's uh, 13 seconds or so of delay that I, I finally fine tuned, f figured out. So when you write, it takes about 13 seconds until I get it and then 13 seconds to respond. So you're looking at, you know, half a minute until we actually engage. Um, here's a new one from Jane. Awesome, so glad I found your concerts on YouTube. Thank you so much. Wonderful to have you, Jane, thank you. So uh, going back, uh, Catherine, early Mother's Day gift, thank you, yes. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all the beautiful mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day tomorrow. I wish you dozens and dozens of roses and peace, beauty in your lives. Thank you for taking the time to, to join me this afternoon. Let's see, any other comments coming in? Avery Alexander, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, I see a few new ones coming in here. Claire, how many hours of music uh, live in your head? <laughs> oh, I, there, there comes a time, um, you know, a, a few, I, I spent probably my, my whole youth, day and night at the, at the piano. Um, when, when I went to high school, I still remember uh, keeping little scores under my desk and analyzing them. I, I was a real piano nerd. So it, it, uh, it, it's been an incredible journey all, all these years. And uh, apparently research, researchers in Germany have found that four hours of practice a day is the, the kind of golden number. 
anything less and we start to we start to f feel uh, um, that we're you know some technical inadequacies and uh, if we do too much we may even start destroying the music so um, the actual however getting back to your question the actual memory process of, of learning a piece of music is more than just sitting at the piano it's actually living and breathing the music where um, on you know an average day a walk in the park you know the chirping of a bird could inspire a certain musical phrase in a different way than I've you know never experienced before um, in 2 a.m. at night I'll sometimes wake up and get the pedaling of, of a certain work just right and then I get so excited about it I, I can't sleep the rest of the night so the process of memory is, is a kind of mixture of just the muscles knowing where to go at the right time and getting deeper and deeper into the musical text where I can literally, like, like, like a nectar, every note becomes expressive and meaningful and means something. And, and that's why uh, great music like the 24 Preludes of Chopin require time to mature and grow every time there's something new every experience like this virtual experience was entirely different than anything I did uh, last year um, you know when, when I played them exactly a year ago in Carnegie Hall that was an entirely different experience for a New York audience now a worldwide audience and each time there's something new and refreshing that that can add to the interpretation let's move on Daniel Kasoy fantastic beautiful thank you thank you great to have you Daniel uh, sounded better than when you did this at Monique's. <laughs> Fabulous performance. <laughs> Happy to support the effort. Thank you, Randall. Thank you. Um, Southern California fan, nice to have you back. Uh, Jane McKenzie, you are most welcome. Absolutely. Uh, another one from Karma. Um, how long does it take you to memorize the music? So this kind of builds upon the last question. It takes uh, anywhere from um, an instant uh, where I can, you know, photographically memorize it and you know in an instant I'll see a piece of phrase we actually had exercises like this in our entrance exams in college where they would give us a piece of music we've never seen before and we had one minute to go over it and then had had to play it and um, the, the the kind of the bright students would just get rid of the score and play it from memory right there and then although that wasn't a requirement so sometimes things can be grabbed in an instant while other music, uh, more complicated music, can can sometimes take take years until it's really ready to perform. Um, Josef Hoffmann, a pianist from the early 20th century, in in his wonderful book, uh, simply called On Piano Playing, On Piano Playing, uh, mentioned that a work should be played at least three times in public until we really start to feel like like we, we own it or, or, or we, we feel um, you know, closer to the interpretation. So that's a, it's a complex question and varies on the music. These works um, ideally require 24 different pianists, each one you know, with the perfect mood at the right time of day, at the right time in their life. Um, it, 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 there are just so many emotional variations with each one that um, they have grown over time. Some of them I played when I was seven or eight years old. Uh, some of them I picked up in my teens. And I really didn't start playing them as a cycle until maybe 10 years ago um, in 2010 when we celebrated the 200th birth of Frederick Chopin. Um, Sophia, I sent my applause before, but bravo and thanks again. Uh, now a question, will you play on that amazing new piano again? Yes, um, I've, I've decided to continue this series uh, all throughout uh, May, every Saturday, same hour, uh, same place, and uh, a different program every time. And we'll, the next Saturday will be a Beethoven tribute, his 250th anniversary. And um, on the 23rd of May, I'm going to do uh, something out of the ordinary and uh, do some improv uh, kind of fun session. Uh, more on that I'll, I'll send to the newsletter. Um, I actually want to invite you to give uh, requests for, for music that you would write, really like to listen to, short piano miniatures. And on the 30th of May, 
uh, the last Saturday of May, I will have a, uh, a special guest, a violinist remotely, and uh, we'll be playing a, a glorious piece of music. Uh, more on that later. P. Preston can feel your enthusiasm and it's more infectious than COVID-19. Thank you, appreciate that. That's a wonderful comment. So I don't see any more comments coming in. We've, we've um, crossed the one o'clock barrier. <laughs> so um, thank you all for your wonderful, wonderful support. It's, it's a pleasure to do this every time. Uh, I feel more and more comfortable. Um, I, I, I always think back to Henryk Goretzky, a uh, Polish composer who called a recording studio the greatest torture chamber on earth. And uh, recording is always a strange, bizarre experience. You know, when you see that little microphone picking up every nuance, it can become terrifying. And in the first few sessions last month, I literally became so neurotic, I couldn't sleep through three full nights. Um, j you know, just the neuroticism of playing for uh, gadgets, you know, with no live public. But uh, now I'm slowly, my brain is kind of training to override that aspect and realize that there are real humans behind every gadget watching this. And I feel your presence more and more with each one, which, which is helping me also with these experiments. So I thank you all once again. I set up this GoFundMe link and uh, it's my first crowdsourcing, crowdfunding um, experiment. And I, I will use those funds to buy new lighting, um, to cover the piano tuning costs, and also the regular expenses required for live streaming. So uh, I will send that out as in the newsletter as well. Uh, it's very simple to donate. They, they, they take all credit cards and make, make the process as uh, simple and convenient for everyone as possible. So on that note, um, uh, I'll see you again Saturday for, for some Beethoven and wish you a beautiful, beautiful Mother's Day weekend. Um, my, my heart's out to all the, 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 the beautiful, wonderful, uh, supportive um, mothers out there. Thank you so much.